it's Kelly at threeboysanddog.com and we're back with another work at home mom strategy hour. This week we're talking about pitching to brands and Susan and I have a nice guest on, Jill from Mom It Forward. So, Hi. I'm going <laughs> to So, I'm going to give a little bit about me. We'll run down the line and then we'll get started. So, as I said, I'm Kelly and I blog at threeboysanddog.com. I've been blogging since November 2006. Um I blog about parenting resources and I do some giveaways and I do a weekly blogging basics post. Um, and then let's see, a few weeks ago, what is this, our fourth week, Susan? Yeah, fourth hangout and we, yeah, we haven't done one for the last two weeks, but this is our fourth in the series. So yeah, we've decided to go to every other week so that we can bring you really good information, maybe get some really good um, experts on and and hopefully you guys will find them useful. So that's me and that's what I'm doing and Susan let's go with you. All right well I'm Susan from 5minutesformom.com and I have lawnmower people outside. Can you, can you guys hear that or I hope that, that isn't, that's not causing any background noise is it? No. Okay good good. All right just distracting for me then. So anyway I'm Susan 5 minutes for mom. I'm thrilled to be hanging out here with Kelly and Jill and we're going to be yeah talking a bunch about how to pitch brands and we brought Jill from Mom It Forward. She's got a lot of experience. So Jill tell us a little bit about your sites. Hi, I'm with momatforward.com and uh, we are a blogger network and community parenting resource site. And I live in Utah, have two boys, and my husband is a dad blogger. So we're kind of like a social media couple. We have a lot of fun. Um, and his name's Troy. He blogs over at dadventurous.com. And we do uh, a lot of Twitter parties. That's kind of what people kind of know us for. We started the GNO Twitter parties almost five years ago, if you can believe that. So that's a little bit about me. Isn't that crazy? So it's crazy GNO. Long ago, Oh, sorry, Susan. I didn't mean to cut you off. So, GNO, oh, no. for those that maybe have never heard of it, don't know what it is, because I had to look it up. It's Girls' Night Out. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound great? It sounds like a great idea. We've had so, to extend it to be Girls and Guys' Night Out, because my husband comes every week. So, he's <laughs> like, come on, dad bloggers, you need to come to this Twitter party, too. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, as I said, we're going to talk about pitching to brands, and we're going to touch on different aspects and talk about how each one of us maybe reaches out and pitches to brands. Um, so I guess we should just, you know, just go ahead and run right into it. Susan, I know you have a whole little outline of things that you wanted to cover, so I'll let you take well, it yeah. from here. Excellent. Thank you so much. There's a lot of content in under this umbrella of how to pitch to, to brands, how to build ad campaigns, and a big topic that falls within that is what we all call media kits. Now, um, it's funny because we Janice and I started way back in 2006, and we started working with brands. And you know, early 2000, I can't remember exactly when we made our first media kit, but sometime way back then. And when the, the first couple of ad companies that had come back to us, or companies that we want, that wanted to advertise with us, they started asking for our ad rate card and and or sometimes our media kit. So we had to go onto Google, find out what do they want in an ad rate card. And of course, we try to act like, oh yeah, very cool. We, Totally know what you mean. Anyway, so an ad rate card, I don't hear that word very often anymore in our in our sort of industry as bloggers. Most people have combined them into um, to a media kit. And we and basically the difference, there's sort of a slight difference, but they usually can be combined. By definition, an ad rate card is a, um, a document containing your prices and descriptions for various ad placement options on a media outlet. And so that's why an ad rate card was a very common standard term. And a media kit is a more vague sort of term. It can include, the document can include information about rates and ad sizes, format, uh, targeting options, your audience profiles, case studies, contact information, and anything else that can help buyers make an informed decision. So there's a lot of um, variation there, and it can often include the prices as well. So that's why you don't often really, I don't think, in this blogging industry that much hear about ad rate cards anymore. Jill, are you ever asked for an ad rate card or just a media kit? No, most people will say, you know, they'll either, either ask for a media kit or they just say, I want to know your services and pricing. So services and pricing to me sounds a little bit like an ad rate card. 
But really when I get into it, they want so much more information that I have found sending a comprehensive media kit works better. Exactly. And how about you, Kelly? Um, yeah, I'm with Jill. They don't really ask. Usually they don't ask. They just ask for rates or they, how much can, you know, is it going to cost me to do this? Um, and I find that a lot of times when I actually send my media kit, I do get the response of, wow, this is the first media kit I've ever gotten from a blogger. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so I think this is a great topic. A lot of you guys really need to have that standard professional thing that you send or that you make available to the brands and the PR companies that are reaching out to you. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the things that I think about, because we're often, you know, we coordinate a lot of campaigns for brands, as do you, Susan, and I'm sure that you guys have run in this to this as well, is that sometimes when we're looking for very specific um, types of bloggers to meet a campaign's very specific needs, right, If it's mm -hmm. especially if it's niche, the first thing that we're doing is going to an about page of a blogger site. And so I can say that even before you think about doing a media kit, make sure that your about page is really robust that it really does include, and I know sometimes it seems like we're bragging, right? Like we're saying, you know, it's like a little resume there. But in addition to saying, like, you know, to writing things about yourself, like where you live and a little bit about your family and what you blog about, it's also really nice to say maybe what major market you're closest to, what types of work, work you like to do with brands. Um, if you've had any sort of notable mentions, like if you've been on you know, the Babel List or the Nielsen's Power Mom 50 or you've spoken at a social media conference or you've been, you know, an ambassador for a brand, just even to include one short little paragraph on your about page can really streamline the process for companies, you know, either agencies or brands or companies who are kind of coordinating that outreach for them. That's such great, great advice and advice that I'm constantly, back, you know, getting mad at myself for not fixing my about page better. I really need to improve our about page. And like you, like you said, it, sometimes it's really, it feels uh, odd to sort of brag or whatever. Yeah. And I know Janice and I are really bad about that. Like we, we tend to not say, oh yeah, we did this and we did that. And we've got to get better about that. That's always, and, and to do, it's one thing. And so we sort of feel more comfortable doing it in a media kit, but then on your about page, it feels yeah, but it's really, really important advice. And I know for me, when I'm pulling, when I'm pulling bloggers, when I'm as soon as I'm looking at someone's blog, I'm reading their about page first thing. Yeah, in yeah. fact, it's you know that just it goes with everything that Crystal. I do a weekly hangout with Crystal from Crystal and Company, and we just did a hangout I think three weeks ago, four weeks ago, where we did ten must-haves for your blog, and that was one of them. You have to have that about me page. It is so very important. And your media kit or your pitch to brands is kind of an extension of that about me page. Yeah. yeah. Very okay, true. so I lost my notes here, Susan. <laughs> okay, so wow. well, Kelly, you had some like we were just mentioned, Kelly. You did an um, a fabulous. I just watched it yesterday as well when when you guys did it. A great media kit demonstration or chat all in your Google Hangout with Crystal yesterday. And so um, people definitely I want to recommend everyone you can in addition to listening to this chat about media kits there's other great information that Kelly and Crystal went in. So we'll link to that um, as well. Kelly, do you have the ha the link handy? I do actually have it. I'm getting ready to put it right here in the comments section. Perfect. That would be awesome. Because definitely everyone afterwards watch that because this is such a big conversation that you can hear tons of different perspectives and that and you definitely want to watch it. gave a lot of great tips in there. So Kelly, why don't you share a little bit more about your just your general advice on, on pitching to brands. You have a lot of really great simple points that you could go through. Um, well, it, it could be a really long thing. Um, <laughs> what Susan is referring to is my really, really, really rough draft of what this hangout well, is going to be about. I just, well, I'll, I'll let, give you some time here to share some of your thoughts. So basically, um, what I was going to say is before you pitch to a brand, you have to have your ducks in a row. You have to know your stats. You have to know your influence. Your, you have to know your pricing structure before you can ever say, hey, come to my house for a party, basically. You have to be able to say, this is when the party is. This is what we're going to have there. This is why we're having the party. So 
back to the ducks in a row. You have to have all that information before you can ever reach out. And I wanted to, we have a comment on our page that says, my blog isn't even popular enough or as well known for me to even have an interesting media kit. It doesn't matter as long as you have something there. What you think, you, you might think you're not popular or you're not big or you're not special, but you have something. Maybe you've worked with a really great brand, or maybe you have an awesome post that you know people have. You have a whole bunch of comments on because people thought it was a really good post. You have something that you can promote. Maybe it doesn't even have to do with blogging. Maybe you, um, like me, when I first started, my thing was that I was um, an international exchange coordinator, and I spoke for all these events about hosting exchange students, and I spent tons and tons of time with exchange students. That's huge. I could speak and that was a big thing for me even though it didn't have to do with blogging. So just kinda if you're brand new starting out there there's something that's really good. What do you think Jill? Do you agree or disagree with that? No, I really agree and, and um, what I'm gonna share right now might not, I mean it, it kind of relates is when I started um, the GNO Twitter parties, it was back in 2008 and when I very first wanted to go after brand sponsorships, um, it wasn't like, I mean, I didn't even have a blog at that point. <laughs> it's funny, I kind of did Twitter first, I went backwards. Um, but what I did was I identified brands that I was passionate about. And even though I didn't have these huge statistics or anything that like, I think that we would now look at and be like, well, there's no way I could ever beat anyone else. You know, like you're thinking, well, if they get, 10 media kits, they're not really going to think mine's important because I don't have this track record. But what I did was I maximized on my passion. And so I reached out to brands and I said, I've got this really great thing going. I'm really passionate about your brand. I had done some research ahead of time and said, I understand that this is your theme for the year. This is kind of some of the outreach that you're doing. I would love it if you would take a chance on me. And in the very beginning, I didn't charge the first many clients that I worked with. Because I just said, I really want to get some case studies of working together. So I would be willing to not charge you, to just work with you as a partner, but kind of in that spirit of, at the end of the day, we're all going to win, right? Like, I'm going to be able to partner with you. I'm going to be able to share my expertise and my passion with my friends, both online and offline. And a few brands really took a risk and partnered with me. And that helped me build some case studies, and then I had something solid to put in my media kit. But in the beginning, it was really all about kind of who I was, what, you know, leveraging past experience, like you're talking about the fact that you were good at speaking, like finding anything that could kind of fit, and then kind of targeting and going after those brands that I felt like I could really, really promote. So I don't know if that helps. Yeah, no, it's great to be aware of your niche and aware and pull in sponsors or companies you can partner with that are lined up with your passion and your niche. That's absolutely the really, really great focus. Okay, so then once you have all your ducks in a row, as Jill and Susan both said, you really need to say why. Why should they work with you? What can you bring to the table that's different not bigger, not better, not greater, or more expensive or cheaper or that's different than what everybody else is bringing to the table. And when Jill started, she was bringing something different. She was bringing these girls' night out events online, in, in person, the whole nine yards. It was totally different than anything else that was being done. So what can you do? Right now, I do Google Hangouts. <laughs> and I am bringing that to the table. <laughs> And, well, and Kelly, that is that's such a great point. I love that you pointed out that to get early in a niche and early in a platform is so powerful. So Jill was early into Twitter. She was basically one of the very first people to invent this concept of kind of a Twitter chat online party. They ended up becoming called Twitter parties, and she was there. She she was making it happen. She like was one of the creators basically of the concept and that is so powerful Kelly you didn't invent Google Hangouts nor did Jill invent mm -hmm. Twitter but right in at the beginning of using it in this way now Google Hangouts have been around for a while but all of a sudden just very recently 
Google Plus has connected in with YouTube in this way so that all of a sudden people are starting to use Hangouts effectively bring the, and as they have merged in with, with, um, with YouTube. And it's funny because right, right now, just in the last couple of weeks, all the information marketers all those all that whole <laughs> industry of guys I'm getting all kinds of emails from from them all about Google Hangouts or the next thing get Google Hangouts or the new webinars and it's you're right there and so Kelly yeah that's it's awesome it's really good to be at the beginning of a real trend Pinterest is a great example of that my friend Zena Harrington she's a real rock star on Pinterest and again she got in right at the beginning of that taking off and she has just bazillions of followers because in the beginning it was it was easier to get followers too and it, there was with group boards well she's awesome I mean it's not like whatever but in the beginning with group boards there was a sort of when you had a group board at when one person followed when someone followed one of the people in the group board everyone got a new follower and so I mean it was just a hockey stick growth when you had group boards in the beginning of Pinterest. So again, when you can get into the beginning of something and focus on that as being your niche. So even though Zena's blog was smaller at the beginning, she got just huge on Twitter, I mean, on, pardon me, on Pinterest so fast that then it brought up her blog and everything else and she's huge. Yeah, and, and promote what you're good at. Like I said, and like Jill said and Susan said, it's not stats. I'm mean, Seriously, it is not stats. I have been blogging forever, and I just applied for Linkwist. Link oh, I just did that too because you know, I don't know. If I you was know. denied. Okay, I was denied. I, I got an email saying I was denied, and they gave me this whole how to improve my social following and all. And of course, I'm like, dude, nineteen thousand Twitter followers is not oh, enough. Well, that's kind of <laughs> so. <laughs> So it doesn't matter because I have a really good friend who has like a thousand Twitter followers, who has like 500 Facebook fans, who hasn't been blogging very long, and she was approved. I was not what they were looking for, and she was. So do not beat yourselves down because you're not big enough or good enough or been around long enough. Go for it. Uh, it the funny thing with stats, too, is that it's never going to be good enough. Ours, I'm constantly so embarrassed by my stats being so low. And, you know, at every level, you're going to be embarrassed and think your stats aren't good enough. And, and that's one of the reasons a lot of us are, you know, we're shy sometimes about sharing our statistics because we're embarrassed it's not big enough or because people would think that my stats should be bigger than what they are, you know. And, but we just I all have to get over ourselves. I think it's all about maximizing your influence. So, I mean, you guys have touched on this earlier is – where where do you have reach? Um, brands really are wanting action, right? So a lot of times they're wanting action on blog posts and people that have numbers, that's gonna be great, right? So they can get sponsored posts and that's wonderful. Um, a lot of times brands are wanting people who can mobilize people into action, right? So maybe somebody that doesn't have a lot of blog followers but has a great video presence and it's great on YouTube or who can get every time they put a funny comment on Facebook get a hundred comments you know or they post a picture on Instagram and they've got this whole conversation going on um, you know any one of those areas you don't have to be all of those things you can look at one of those areas and just be good in that area and really allow your personality to shine in one of those areas. Some people, it's in real life, so they're great for um, sponsorships at conferences and things like that. I think the mistake sometimes that we make as bloggers is we look and we say, I have to be all of those things, and I want all of those opportunities, and therefore I'm not good enough if I don't have a media kit that's super well-rounded in all of those areas. And I think sometimes we need just need, and going back to what you said earlier, Kelly, is to play off of our strengths and really show the brand who we are in this one area. And what I have found that's really interesting is that when we play off of our strengths, people typically think that we're strong in all of the areas because we are showing our personality in one area. So I, I think my biggest encouragement is not to get discouraged if you are not where, you're, you, where you want to be in every single area. Obviously, create strategies to grow in those areas, but really play off of the area that you're very, very strong. And then, you know, grow as you go. 
And really, I mean, you can only focus on one thing. Come on, none of us are superwoman, and none of us really aspire to be, I wouldn't think. So you can't have this huge Twitter following and this huge Facebook following and this huge Instagram and keep all of those things going. You can't. I mean, there's... You have to find what you're really good at. You obviously still need to work all the others because that's the time that we're in, but you need to work hardest at what you're best at, and that's what you need to promote. I think you said it very well, Jill. Susan? Yeah, exactly. And as Teresha in the comments here has said, that, yeah, it's about cultivating a community. A community is really powerful if you... And it's, these days, it's really hard to get a lot of comments on p blog posts and to, and to get a lot of interaction on your blog posts. And if you can show that you actually your community even comments on your posts and engages with you, that's really powerful too. So tie in that kind of um, content for sure in, in pitching. Okay, so all right. So where are we at here now, uh, Kelly? Um, yeah, I wanted to... I wanted to, um, Jamie says we have low followers, but that's because we don't falsely inflate them by requiring likes or follows for giveaways. I don't consider that falsely inflating them. If people are coming to your site for a giveaway, you want them to be able to come back to your site and to find out what's going on about you. So you should promote your other things that, your other social media channels so that they can find you elsewhere. Susan, what is your idea on that? That's a, it's a really interesting point. Um, some people do kind of feel that, you know, requiring a like on your Facebook or follow me on Twitter and giveaways. I can see how some people might think that, oh, that's kind of like fake followers. But it, it's one of these subjective things. And, it, and I would tend to not jump to the conclusion of saying, oh, those are fake followers or, oh, so-and-so inflated their stats by doing it that way. Um, it's it's tough because you don't want to judge other bloggers for doing something a certain way even if you choose not to do it that way. It's kind of tough. But um, I, yeah, it's a hard thing. It, it, and the giveaway and review blogs are a, a, a bit of a different beast and, than a mom blog that doesn't do giveaways and reviews. Now, if, for example, when we host Ultimate Blog Party, we group our mom blogs into two different categories. Mom blogs that are working with doing reviews and giveaways are peer friendly or that those that don't want to do giveaways don't want to engage in that way and in that situation you know definitely bloggers that aren't in doing giveaways and that type of thing wouldn't ask for likes in their you know in those types of manners so their followers may be smaller but then in that way but they are going to get followers for laughs and that type of thing. So, you know, for if there's, say, for example, laughs if they're a funny blogger. And, of course, so, for example, like you could take Amber from Crappy Pictures. I mean, she is just hilarious. Her blog obviously doesn't have giveaways and reviews in it. Her stats and her numbers are just sky high. Her Facebook engagement is huge. And, yeah, I mean, props to her in that you could sort of say her followers, are they more authentic? than others. Well, yeah, I mean, she's just pure hilarious quality content that went virally and I'm just so happy for her. That's just awesome. She's a different type of blog because whether or not like our blog or another friend's blog is a review blog or includes giveaways and they ask for likes on Facebook pages, um, you know, as part of giveaways and stuff, I'm not going to say that there's are false or inflated? They're just different. They're different beasts. Different, different. Just totally different kinds of blogs. Um, and then the line of whether or not you ask for for likes and stuff is all part of. You know, it gets kind of all in with terms of services and stuff like that, right? So you have to be careful of how you do it, and if you use Rafflecopter, how you, you know, how you do it. And I'm not the expert, really, even on those rules and. And whatever I, what I would call falsely in um, inflating stats, my definition of that would be using uh, automated following and buying following software. Mm -hmm. That's that's true falsely, and that's what like tons of people in the info marketing kind of world. There's so many people that truly falsely yeah. grow numbers, especially on Twitter. Um, yeah. that's you know, a true falsely. 
can I play off of one thing that you were saying, Susan? Like, I think that, um, you know, that there is, you know, it's subjective for sure. And that people, um, you, you're going to want to do what you feel comfortable with. So I think that that's the most important thing. I think there's two positive ways to look at including likes or, you know, re requirements for your giveaways, you know, that, that include liking or following or whatnot. Um, one is if you look at it in terms of sometimes people really don't know about you until they have the chance to visit your community or to follow you on Twitter and sometimes they otherwise would not really know you. So there's one thing, one way to look at it as you're allowing that person to kind of get to know you. Um, the other way to look at it I think is when we coordinate blog tours for brands and they're looking for, I mean we'll do hundreds of bloggers sometimes for brand um, blog tours, they really are, the reason that they're engaging with bloggers and often compensating them to do reviews and giveaways is because they want to grow their following and they want to uh, they want their and the reason that they're working with specific bloggers is because they're wanting those bloggers followers and friends to be exposed to their products and services and so sometimes the best way to expose someone to a product or service is to say, hey, go check this out through a like or a follow. Obviously, you can unfollow later if you want to, or you can not continue to like that page. But it just is a little incentive for um, a follower of a specific blogger who's blogging about it to go and kind of get to know this brand a little bit more. And in the same way, it would be an, an invite almost to kind of have that follower or that um, that, that participant in your giveaway to follow and learn more about you as well. And again, if they decide after a little while that, oh, you know what, this isn't really my cup of tea, I don't want to follow this person, they can always unfollow. I don't know. That's just maybe a little positive way to look at it. But still, I think, you know, if, if your feeling, if your gut feel is that that is inflating or getting false followers, then my recommendation would be to not do it. <clears throat> right. Yeah, I agree. Um, and Teresha says, point taken, Jamie, but giveaways do bring in followers, but engagement keeps them coming back. And Susan exactly. said that earlier about engagement on the Facebook page. And that's true. Your giveaways, if you have a giveaway, you can. I, I don't require people to follow me on Twitter. I don't require them to follow the brand. But that is an option out there, and I hope that that gets them coming back. And I spend a lot of my time on Twitter, so it is the engagement. I try talking to people and retweeting their stuff and just chit-chatting my random thoughts on Twitter, I use it the way a lot of people use their Facebooks. So yeah, it, it's the engagement, not necessarily the numbers. And you can even go in and you can look, if you're not sure, you go in and look at their followers. And if they have a whole bunch of spam looking followers, a whole bunch of you know half-naked women on there, then you know <laughs> that they've bought their followers somewhere. That it's that, like Jill said, that's inflating the followers. Okay. So, sorry, sidetracked. I'm scrolling through all the comments. I love the back and forth chit-chatting. So, Susan, you want to move on to the next? Sure. Well, what we could talk about, why don't we go a bit more in depth into media kits for a little bit here. Um, Jill, what would your recommendation be for a blogger making her first media kit? What would just be a, a little bit of advice? Wow, for our first media kit, I mean, fortunately, and I think you touched on this earlier, Susan, there are so many examples online. Like when I was creating my first media kit, I just wanted to cry. <laughs> I mean, there just weren't really a whole lot. And I remember at the time, Jennifer James from Mom Bloggers Club had a really, really great template. It was very simple. I'm sure it's probably still out there. It you is. can Google it. Okay, Mom Bloggers Club media kit. I mean, she's just, Jennifer James is fabulous. And she just kind of whittled it down. Um, so I think my first recommendation would be to keep it really simple. Um, also to include just the, the basic information that a brand would want to know. What are your numbers? What are you blogging about? What local market are you the closest to? I know like with our community, we coordinate a lot of live events and we are constantly needing to know who, what bloggers are in what markets because we want to be able to give bloggers opportunity to attend and partner with brands, but we can't know if it doesn't say it on their blog or in their media kit. So I think including your market is really important. Um, I think also including um, past information, things that you've done. I know Kelly was saying this earlier. If you've had a, a brand interaction that's gone really well, you're going to want to include that. Um, you know, if we're talking about just starting out, so again, keep it simple. Include really basic pertinent information 
that you know that brands would want to know. And then um, any sort of, if you have any sort of case study type information, um, I would include it. Now, if you're just starting out, you might not have it, so you might want to create it or try. But my biggest recommendation where case studies come into play, and I'm kind of learning this the hard way, is that the earlier that you can capture stats and get testimonials for your involvement with brands, the better your media kit down the road is going to be. So I just would say that do the most that you can to figure out what the results were from your interaction with the brand. I mean, if it's a simple blog post, then you're going to want to look and you're going to want to say, okay, when I participated with this brand, I got X number of entries in my giveaway. I got X number of hits to the, to the post. You know, or if you do a YouTube video, I got this many viewers. Or if you were at a Twitter party as a panelist, um, you know, you can say that you were engaged during this party and the party was very successful and the, and maybe the community five minutes for mom, mom at four wanted to have you back as another panelist. Those types of things are really great. And testimonials are also really wonderful. Brands often want to know, are you credible? Are you professional or are you going to cause them drama? Are you going to go out and negatively, you know, write tweets that make them look bad. So if you can have some testimonials about how you had a great and professional reputation working with brands, then that would be great. And I know that's a little bit down the road for some of those of you who maybe are beginning and looking for that first media kit. But as long as you're thinking about that and you have that in mind, you can create it for every campaign you get involved in. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. That, that is really helpful, Jill. And one of the things I really want to emphasize with media kits is the variety, the range. I mean, mm -hmm. there's as much range in media kits as there are in blogs, okay? So when you start, keep it simple, keep it shorter. You can change it as you go. Try to, like um, Jill said, try to be keeping uh, an eye out as you go along for things that you can then include in your media kit, for example, good quotes and, and things like that from uh, recommendations. Now, one of the things I'm a, for me when I want, was trying to do my first media, our first media kits, and even as we're moving forward, revising, creating new media kits, this type of thing, I want to actually see some media kits personally. I am like, <laughs> you're telling me what's supposed to go in it? Show me something. So I am going to do some screen share here if I can. I can screen share, right? Yeah, while you're pulling that up, I just wanted to touch base on what Jill said. But I can screen share, right, from my, even though I didn't create the Hangout? Yes, you just pushed the little TV up there. Okay. But while you're pulling that up, I wanted to touch base on what Jill said when she was talking about how to get all of that stuff to put into your media kit, where she was talking about, you know, pulling all of your information and knowing your stats and knowing your stats of your campaign and knowing what your reach was. And um, you know, that's so important. That's your follow-up. And Crystal and I actually talked about that a few weeks ago in a Google Plus Hangout where we were talking about finding giveaway sponsors and advertisers and and brands to partner with for campaigns and we talked about that follow-up and if you do that follow-up and we talked about it step by step but if you do that then you gather that information and so you can create a, a case study so yeah very good advice very very good advice and I'm going to share that link right here okay great and then so, I'm going to click on Susan to make her thing show up okay so here we go okay excellent is it showing yep everybody should see Susan's media kit right now Okay, so this is an example of our current media kit that has no prices in it. What we do is we keep two versions of our media kit, one that has prices and one that doesn't. And we keep this online with a pretty link. What we do is, so when, if you look up in the browser right now, you'll see a long convoluted link to it. But I didn't get to it that way. I just got to it by saying 5 minutesrom.com slash media and it redirects to this. That way, every anytime I want to upload, I can upload and change it with updates, which we do every so often, then it, it, the, the re link that's out there to everyone is just redirected, okay? So it's a pretty link, it's just 5 minutesromcom slash media. Okay, so we have a little cover page, we have some really outdated photos of our kids really, um, you know, from when they were really young, yeah. which we should update sometime, and here's Janice interviewing Reed Drummond this pioneer woman. That's a, sort of 
right away for people that recognize her can recognize that we've interviewed her. Okay, so we you know there's just a simple title page in our we have a button about us section where we've got a very outdated picture of us and <laughs> which we should, again should update. But, um, a little couple of sentences about about what five minutes from moments about. We have a little section what sets us apart. Um, we have a little bit of blah 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 stuff there about again about who we are. We've got a couple of notable. Uh, things that we were recognized for for being in Wall Street Journal and a couple things like that. We go. This is further going further into our about us, where we talk a little bit more about what we what we do. That we are often spokespeople for different brands. That we speak on camera. Janice has done a lot of live interviews. We have a quote here from Ali Worthington, co-founder of Blistem, saying that Janice is a dynamic speaker. Um, we've got these links to some videos and things that we've done for different brands. This is a nice, simple way to toss in uh, logos of all the different brands you work with. So just a, a quick glance, people can see. Oh, okay, they work with brands. We've got a little quote here from Edelman PR that they've enjoyed partnering with us. So just right away there to build credibility very quickly, just in a glance. Here we toss in our stats, so about our site, we've got some screenshots. Um, we toss in some of our numbers. One of the things is we don't necessarily even put an exact, you can say 40,000 plus, so that you don't have to, you know, if it goes up or down a tiny little bit, round it up or down to something reasonable. And we put a screenshot from Google Analytics in. That was from January. Again, a little bit out of date, but it's good enough. And we'll update again pretty soon. Um, and this describes a little bit more about things that we do. So this says what we do. We're a personal mom blog. We do product reviews. Uh, we do videos. We have this special thing called an ultimate blog party. We have to talk about our directories, charity that we do, our network of sites. And then we get, so that's about just stuff. Ours is, again, very long. Yours doesn't have to be long for all that stuff. Our site, we do a lot of different things, and so it's a longer media kit. Um, here, now the formatting is being messed up as I'm browsing in this PDF here. I don't know. I'm on a Mac right now. Promoting your brand, this should say. So I've got to check out why this isn't showing up properly. But anyway, we have... Here we show some of the ad placements, and you can notice in this version, you see, I don't have the prices listed. We have POA, which means price on application. Okay, so we have a, another duplicate version of this one that has all the prices listed, and that's what we will send out when we want someone to actually see our prices. Okay, but um, there I give some examples of different ad spots. Well, this is an easy way to show it. Take a screenshot of your site, put a little blank box in the different positions to just really visually make it clear what spots you're selling. Um, we talk about different ways of post sponsorship. That's a different ad spot. We have an ad spot at the top of the site again. Then we talk about giveaways. And um, we talk we offer that we have a different couple of options of giveaways. We we often offer reduced price rates for mom blogs. So we include that in there. Not mom blogs, pretty mom owned businesses. I noticed the formatting is really messed up on this online version of here a little bit, but anyhow. Promoting your brand. Uh, we talk about conference sponsorship options that we can do speaking and consulting. And then here on the last page, we have Let's Talk, and we have information for our assistant, Jennifer, who does all of our ad sales. And so she's got her contact information there. She includes even her phone number there. And again, a couple more quotes from different agencies that we've worked with. So that's a very long media kit, OK? Um, and to be honest, I'm constantly thinking, oh, we need to make up a one pager. And, and I, to be honest, again, just like your stats will never feel good enough, your media kit can never feel sort of if you're like me, sort of never feel good enough, I'm like, oh, we need to redo our media kit, and so we need to re redo it and get a better one. That one, we've made this, this was made a couple years ago and just updated, so we're in, we're, we're around time now that we should be updating ours as well. You're still screen share. sharing, Susan. What was that? You're still screen sharing? Oh, okay, can you see 
Did it switch pages? Yeah. Okay, good. I want to switch to this page. What I want to show here, this, I'm going to put the link in. This is a great post. Friend, um, Scraps of My Geek Life. This is awesome by Michelle. I'm going to, I'll put the link in there in a second, but I, the way I said there are so many resources out there right now to help you, this is not back in 2008, like when we were trying to make early versions and there were only examples of huge websites that had media kits and it was really hard for us to get started. Now it's so easy, okay, there are so many examples. Michelle wrote a post up here, this is a post she wrote actually a couple years ago, this is from 2010, but I went through and checked all the links and they're still all very relevant. And here she's got it listed a bunch of resources to help you write your media kit. And in this post you'll find the link to uh, Mom Blogger's media kit template, which actually I'm just going to switch over here and show you. Oh, that's just a different one. Just one sec. This here, can you guys see this? This is on a site called Scribed, okay? But this is the mom blog template from Mom Bloggers Club that that Jill just mentioned, okay? So on this Scribed site, you can see examples of templates. Okay, so this mom blogger one that Jennifer James, one of my absolute blogging heroes, is Jennifer James from Mom Bloggers Club. Here she's made this really simple template, okay, and she's got questions in here for you to sort of fill out and just boom, put it together. Like just some really simple options, okay, it doesn't have to be a whole big designed thing like ours is right now. Okay, here's another media kit example that's also on that scribed site. Here, this one is from our good friend Tara, and she is she's got a fabulous example here. Um, so her, she's got a cover page there, she links it, and she has these sections for contents that links and you can go through where she shows you should have an overview, benefits to companies and advertisers, the focus, she says write about what the focus of your blog line is, what's your tagline, content, what type of content do you post, is it a diary or an informational blog, do you post podcasts or videos, do you have polls, so th this type of thing is you're describing what's in your blog. Press, and they hear again, what press have you, has your blog received, if any? You know, if you're new, don't put a press section if you haven't had any yet. There's a section for audience and your metrics, demographics, and your social media footprint. So these are all of your presence on the different social media platforms. She again gets into ad formats and pricing. She uses a simple table format again here. So this really makes it easy to just follow someone's proven example that totally works. Do you guys have, want to share some thoughts on any? Um, if you can pull those links up, Susan, and stick yeah. them in the chat. A lot of people are asking for them. So there is Michelle's summary post where you're going to find a bunch of those links, and I will put these links in. Okay, um, and then Sharon wants to know, she says, I have a question about stating brands that you've worked with. <clears throat> Let's say I worked with a brand as part of a campaign through someone like Mom at Forward. Can I include the brand's logo saying that I worked with them or not really since I didn't contract with them directly? I'll let Jill cover that. Jill? Yeah, you know what? I work with brands all the time through their agencies. So it would be comparable to, you know, you working with Mom at Forward, I'm speaking to the person that's asking the question, um, and, and then working on behalf of, say, Dole Fruit Parfaits or something like that. So I do that all the time personally. I, I use it in my media kit, uh, but I'm not necessarily using it in uh, external promotion as I would need to have permission to use that logo in other places. So I think that's the thing to consider is that there usually are legal um, requirements for using a brand's logo, say like on your website. And so you would want to get permission from them to use it on your website, but in a media kit, my understanding is that it's perfectly acceptable to put the brands that you've worked with, you know, before. And I, and I think a lot of people understand, especially brands that, you know, a lot of brands have upwards of like 15 different agencies and yeah. that they're, um, the way that they're working with bloggers is through 
a liaison, either a mom blogger network, like Five Minutes for Mom or Mom at Forward, or like, you know, through an agency. So I think it's perfectly okay. Yeah, I agree. I do too. I do it. Whether I actually work with the brand one on one, like like I've done with Kenmore and Tropicana, or whether I go through someone like Mom at Forward or Mom Bloggers Club or or Five Minutes for Mom, I still consider that I'm working with that brand, even if I am going through somebody else. So yeah, I think it's okay. One thing I, I want one thing I want to point out is kind of back up just a little bit in terms of you know it's really great to put a media kit together, but I think sometimes like we need to be thinking. Um, how are we reaching out to brands? Because, you know, I think, Kelly, you said in the beginning that brands don't often ask you for your media kit. So, you know, sometimes like when, you, when you're putting together a media kit, you need to be thinking about what your strategy is and how you're going to be reaching out to those brands. And in a media kit, it's really kind of all about us, right? We're writing and, you know, sometimes it feels a little braggy, you know, we're, we're saying all, we're hopefully trying to say all of the great things that we do and all of our accomplishments and all of those types of things, like a resume, right? But when we're actually pitching brands, it really should be all about them and about how we can help them. And so I think as, you know, as we're talking about media kits and we've got these great templates and, you know, and some of them are easy. And like you, like you saw with Susan's Five Minutes for Moms, it's more detailed. They've just got years and years of experience and all sorts of things that they can say. And whether you're going a simple route or, or a more detailed route doesn't really matter. I think the strategy and how you are approaching brands, if you are indeed are approaching them, is really important to consider. And to, to kind of shift that thinking of it's all about me when you're reaching out to them and making it all about them. And so really doing some research ahead of time to find out what campaigns they're doing and then when you pitch them talking to them about maybe how you can fit in to help them meet their needs if that makes any sense. I agree wholeheartedly and I'm so glad you said that. Um, you know I think we've kinda gotten off track with the whole media kit because this chat is how to pitch to <laughs> brands. It's not how to repitch or how to answer a brand when they pitch you so I'm very glad you said that and we have about 13 minutes so I'd love to actually go over how to pitch brands and what you do if you are saying for example Kenmore I wanted to work with Kenmore I love Kenmore I had a Kenmore refrigerator and Hurricane Katrina took it and everything else and I wanted the big huge elite massive refrigerator and I just that's not something I can afford on my husband's teacher salary so I wanted to work with them and I wanted to you know, I wanted to get that refrigerator in my house and promote them and talk about their company. So that is a company that I actually reached out to. And I'm sure you have companies that you've actually said, you know, I really want to work with this company. It's not, oh, let me scroll through my emails. Okay, yes. It's, I want to work with them. I want to go out and grab a hold of them and get them to like me because of what I can do for them. So how, how would you suggest doing that, Jill? I mean, I think there's a variety of ways, right? I mean, I think first and foremost, you know, if we're ever going to really, you know, make a friendship, right? Like I always think of brand relationships just like friendships. Um, it's always great to do it in real life, right? Like, I mean, if you can ever be in person with a brand or their representative through an agency, it's really great. So if you can go to social media conferences or and nowadays there's so many local events um, that are taking place all around the nation that you all, all, honestly don't even need to travel outside your own state or region a lot of times. So getting out to those local events I think is really important and you know kind of forming that relationship, getting one-on-one -on -one with those people and don't think of it in terms of you know I mean as much as we talk about elevator pitches and sales really think about it in terms of I want to form a friendship with this person. So I think getting live <clears throat> you know in person is a really great thing. That's not always possible. The next best thing is social media, I think, because sometimes on Twitter you can form a relationship that almost feels like you know this person in real life. I mean, how many times have you talked to somebody on Twitter, met them in real life, and felt like you knew them because of that relationship that you had formed on Twitter? I mean, this has happened to me so many times. So I would say that first live, second, or first, whatever, you know, a close second is social media, really getting to to know that person and then there's just going to be the times when like Kelly who wanted to work with Kenmore you're like I really want to work with this brand but maybe you have never had the opportunity to meet them or whatnot I mean sometimes I literally will get on Google and I'll search for a press release from a brand just to find out who their representative is 
and that person can either be directly in-house with their PR agency or they can be outsourcing it to a larger agency and sometimes it's either about sending a quick email when we've done surveys with brands they typically come back and say that they like a quick email first or sometimes if I really want to work with them and I'm just not getting through I literally will pick up the phone and either call directly to their PR agency or to their in-house internal PR group and just say you know what I'm really interested in getting to know you better I'd love to talk about what your objectives are and what you have going on and how we might partner and just really starting kind of that dialogue I think that um, and sorry I'm like sharing you know a lot here but so you've got the in-person you've got local events you've got social media you've got you know searching online through Google or purchasing lists and finding out who works for who and who's you know who you want to get in touch with um, and then I just think a simple email or a simple phone call is sometimes the very best way to start that relationship so that would be my kind of short list I agree I live in the dirty south and there is nothing near me I mean I tell people I live south of Mobile Alabama and people think I live you know on an oil rig no there's actually a lot <laughs> south but there's nothing around me you know the closest thing would be New Orleans and it's about two hours one way so there's nothing here so that in live is just not doable for me so I do I did and that's what I did with Kenmore because I didn't have a contact um, I actually started just the conversation on Twitter and I chit chatted with them and I built up that relationship just like Jill says and then eventually I was like hey you know what let's try to take this off Twitter I'd love to actually talk with you about something that we could do together and and they did and it took me a while of this back and forth it's not like I said hey Kenmore send me a refrigerator it took a while of this back and forth chit chat it actually took me about three and a half months um, to get six thousand dollars worth of appliances sitting in my kitchen from Kenmore and I work with them I, I work on their Cookmore site on a regular basis it's a relationship that we were able to build so I think when you're doing your cold pitches it really depends on what you're wanting out of it if you're wanting some big massive thing you've got to provide return on investment you know what what are they gonna get out of giving you thousands of dollars worth of car refrigerator travel whatever it is um, if it's something small you, you need to build your pitch around what you're wanting and and that was one thing I wanted to um, kind of say basically your perfect pitch once you've built that relationship whether in person or social media or whatever is basically hey I'm so and so my blog is such and such and I would love to work with you regarding whatever it is that you want to regard it what you want to work with them um, with because I think you would fit me and my site well for this reason and make it very personal even if you're like sending out a thousand at one time take the time to change it how many of you get annoyed when you get dear webmaster we think that you would be the perfect fit for this you know right. what crystal say yesterday car oil thing okay I don't write about cars why would that be so you need to do the exact same thing that you're wanting the brands to do to you Susan well, you've been oh, quiet for really a while not sure can I say one thing really quick because I forgot one thing and I'm just just really fast is I think word of mouth and asking I think a lot of us are very connected or we're not very connected but maybe we have a few connections and so you know what if like I went to Susan and I said hey Susan you know I really really want to work with a cheese brand because you know cheese is my favorite thing on the planet <laughs> and, Susan's like, and I knew that Susan maybe had a relationship with my favorite cheese brand and I said hey would you mind making an e introduction and Susan's like absolutely totally fine and so then you're doing that or you just go to your friends who are other bloggers and you say you know what I'd really like to meet some people um, can you connect me the other thing is as a community and Susan maybe you can speak to this is that squeaky wheel really does get the oil I mean a lot of times when we're coordinating blogger campaigns we only have a limited amount of spots but we have hundreds and thousands of people that are wanting this one or these 40 spots or whatnot and sometimes the people in our community that are coming to us and saying you know what I really want this specific type of a job or please consider me it they're gonna be top of mind so I don't know Susan maybe that's your same experience yeah absolutely we we definitely share share contacts and we work with people and when we're pulling together we very, have to do it really fast like, you know oh we gotta get pull ten bloggers together for each pulling on this post and yeah we often go with our friends people that we know and we have to make really decisions fast lots of times and that's the same with with everyone I want to share in the links here a link 
that Mama Dweeb wrote. It was fantastic, a really simple pitched letter that she shared with someone who was looking for getting a conference sponsorship. But it applies to everyone. Again, it's a really simple sort of idea or a template that you can use for writing a, a perfect pitch letter to someone. And really, when you're making those, a lot of the time, the first contact, you want to keep the email short. You don't want to include your media kit right away. You want to get into a dialogue. In the early days especially, when Janice and I did built all our campaigns ourselves before we had an assistant and, and when we were creating the whole concept of giveaways and how to do them and all this kind of stuff, we would, for any bigger campaigns, get on the telephone. And we will still often get on the telephone with uh, a brand where we're, if we're building a creative campaign with them and, and talk to them about what their needs are. And again, you, want to, you don't want to get on the phone and start talking all about yourself. You want to ask them questions and then listen because you want to find out what their objectives are and how you're going to meet their objectives. And don't be afraid to say, you know what, I would love to craft the perfect campaign for you, so when would be a good time for me to follow up? Don't be afraid to not give them the information right then and there. Once oh, you exactly. know what their objective I is, take the time to actually do it. Don't spur the moment, spit it out off the top yeah. of your head. So oh, exactly. And that's what I would definitely do. So I'd get on the phone with them, we'd hear what they want to accomplish, and then I'd say, okay, I'm going to brainstorm ideas, and then we're going to get back to you. And this was, like I say, in the early days when we were really inventing new ideas of how to do stuff. Now, a lot we do a lot of the same stuff over and over and over, and everyone does giveaways, and so it's not, each time you're not thinking of a brand new way to promote them. But it's still, again, give yourself that time to come back with even a price or an option and then say, okay, I'll, uh, I'll email you back to follow up. Yeah, but, but yeah, so yeah, do not be afraid to do that. It's actually more professional yeah. sometimes. Even, even if you already know exactly what you're going to do for this brand because mm -hmm. you've spent the last three months trying to come up with the perfect thing to get that car, still step back. Let me come up with something really good for you. Let's see what we can and, and step back and just give it a minute and they'll be like, "Oh, wow, she's so professional. You know, she took time to actually build this perfect campaign just for me." So, yeah, step back and just say, "I mean, you're the one leading the show." So, mm -hmm. you know, Kelly, you touch on something that is is so important to me because we're talking a lot about how to get in the door in that first step, right? And you get that first campaign. But so much about the blogging world is once you're in then you can very easily get follow-up campaigns. But it all depends on how you, how you are um, professionally with every single campaign that you are, that you're doing. Susan mentioned that a lot of times if she has 10 bloggers in a blog tour or, or a campaign that she needs to reach out to, she's going to go to the people that, she, you know, like are her friends or, or people who have performed well in the past. And I think it's really, really important to make sure that your professionalism is going to get you that repeat business, right? So, you know, I know one time we did a campaign and we have a team that, you know, that will gather, that watches all the stats and that goes and grabs everyone's URLs and is, you know, really tracking. We have a follow-up survey for people to tell us kind of, you know, their links and everything. But one time I remember, um, this was like about a year and a half ago, so it was kind of before we had this team in place. And this blogger, we actually did a, a press junket where we took about 15 families to Universal Orlando Resort. So we partnered with them, and it was great, right? It was wonderful. But this one blogger from the trip, when she got back, I would say it was about two weeks after the trip, she sent me this follow-up email. I didn't ask for it, and I didn't expect it. And she included links to all of her blog posts, the Google Analytics numbers for all the hits to those posts, all of the original links to any of her social media promotion, which was a ton, and a series of pictures that we could provide with to the brand if they wanted to use for anything. And I remember just sitting and looking at that email and thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Because it took us so much time to gather that for each and every individual that to have one person go out of their way, which probably didn't even take her that long, and to send that along with a thank you that said, we would love to partner with you anytime. She has... She is just continually at the top of my list because I know that her professionalism just is off the charts. And so you constantly, when you know, when a brand or an agency or a mom blogger network is looking for people to reach out to, they're constantly looking for those people that are kind of going that little bit of an extra mile to show that professionalism, that they're always going to be kind of your go-to people. And I think 
that we want to give new people, you know, we want to give new bloggers a chance. We want to really, really embrace and have more of an inclusive environment and have a lot of people participate. But those people that really are professional, that are not lambasting in case something goes wrong and a giveaway product doesn't arrive on time or whatever, but that they're still remaining positive and that they provide you with the stats and those types of things. You know, it just makes it easy to work with those people again. So yeah, whenever we I do Twitter parties as well, and I reach out, we include um, ten other bloggers plus a, an extra co-host, and it's the same thing. There are certain people that are in my tribe that are fresh in my mind at all times, and those fill the first spots because I know how they work. I know what they're going to provide. I know that they're going to do one hundred and ten percent for me on that campaign but then I usually have other spots because not all of my friends will fit that niche or or whatever and then it's where you open up to the new people and again it's the people that are fresh in your mind it's the ones that interact with you on Facebook or on your blog or on Google Plus or whatever it is it's those people that that are fresh and then you give it to them and if they don't deliver then they don't they don't get asked into the next one unless we have you know they're really a perfect fit and we just have to use that person but yeah it's all about professionalism and honestly if you're doing a campaign for somebody else it should be more I think you should do more than what's asked of you because you want them to come back I mean like over she deliver. just said they did over a, you delivering know, is always a great strategy over deliver it is but just like with guest posts Posting. When you write a guest post for somebody else's site, anybody like pro blogger will tell you it should be the best post that you have ever written anywhere on somebody else's site. It's the same concept with these campaigns that you're working with somebody else. It should be the best campaign that you have ever done when you do your part for someone else. Do you agree or disagree? Absolutely. I put way more time into into a post that's part of a campaign then you know then if it's post just might you know that that's not yeah I and I was really intrigued the other day um, we have this gal in our community and you know she often gets you know paid sponsored campaigns and I know that you know the whole you know paid campaign versus unpaid campaign is a very big topic in the blogging world and we definitely you know obviously want to be compensated for the effort that we're putting forward forth on behalf of brands but um, or for brands but this gal I thought was very interesting because um, she came to us, she learned about this campaign that we were doing. She actually didn't get selected for the campaign. There were a, a very few spots and she didn't get selected for whatever reason the brand didn't choose her. And she came to us two weeks later and she said, you know what, I love this cause so much that I'm going to write a post for free. And I remember just kind of stepping back and going, wow we've got to get her into some more paid campaigns because at the end of the day she cared more about the content and the message and being professional that we want to work things out like we want everybody to get paid and we want everyone to you know have those great experiences but she went the second mile and really appreciated it and took note of it That's awesome. okay y'all we're over by two minutes so <laughs> we need to um, we need to be wrapping up and Susan do we know what we're talking about week after next we're going to survey our, our audience a bit more and find out what you guys want to hear and then we're going to come back with the decision of the topic. So we'll be coming back here two weeks, same time, same place, two weeks from now and we'll confirm through, we'll leave a message on this post as well on our blogs and Twitter and stuff about what our next topic will be. Awesome. And Jill, I'm so glad you were on. I really loved getting to know you. We didn't know nice each other too. outside. So uh -huh. I, I, we're going to continue this later, right? Definitely. Yeah. All thanks right. for having me. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Bye. All right, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.